good evening. Welcome to the United Stand. This is your Manchester United versus Chelsea preview. It's also your reaction to the big news that Ineos have spoken to Manchester United players individually about the club, about the future. Now, there's a big thing to be said about this. I don't care what the players think about Manchester United's future. And I think this has been the mistake that we have made for the last decade pampering to certain players, empowering them in a dressing room. The success of Manchester United and Sir Alex Ferguson was the fear he held. Remember speaking to Incy, Gary Neville, people like that, they wouldn't dare say anything behind the manager's back. This modern phenomenon with asking players, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? We'll be talking about that as well, taking your opinions. A little bit early tonight because we're going to be on that's football for uh, West Ham against Spurs. There's still a slim chance that if West Ham were to win and we were to beat Chelsea, maybe we could get back into that Champions League spots, although I don't think that's possible. Um, a reveal behind the boohoo man of what team I think we should go for against Chelsea as well. You can't tell. You can probably tell Delo and wan and that's about it. And I think I can see a bit of a ho. Maybe it's Santa. I mean, I'm, ho. Not, not that type of ho. A ho on the end, look. I've gone and dug a hole. Right, okay. Let's get into it. But before we, before we get into it, we've got a boohoo man uh, um, sponsorship where we're going to be asking you for the player I'm describing. But don't forget, Boohoo Man have been with us for years. Fantastic clothing at a reasonable price, but you can get an extra 10% off with the code Goldbridge. They've got lots of discounts across the site. So if there's a 30% discount, you can add Goldbridge as another discount and you will get an extra 10% off. So check that out through the link in the description or by scanning the QR code. You can get a lovely little hoodie like this. Doesn't matter what the weather is, it's fleece lined. It just makes you feel great. Sometimes I go naked underneath it from the top half from the bottom half my ass would still be on show check it out with boohoo man and because boohoo man are sponsoring the show they've got a bit of trivia for you as well so guess the manchester united player who am i i was born on may the 21st 1977 they're older than me they must be in the 60s my youth career started at tottenham however i never played a first team game there i before joining united i played in spain for mallorca and atletico madrid i joined united in uh, 99 for one and a half million after impressing sir alex ferguson on trial despite playing in three premier league winning seasons i never played the required 10 games stipulated to earn a winner's medal. However, I did receive a medal for special dispensation following United's win in 2003. I left United in 2006 to join Bolton and I remain the only South African player to ever play for Man United. I only got that on the last two clues. Um, of course, it's Quinton Fortune. Congratulations if you got that one. Uh, don't forget to check out Boohoo Man, scan that QR code through the link in the description, get on the website at some point, use that code Goldbridge, get your discount. Absolute legends. Thank you very much for that. It's definitely not nanny. Right, um, let's take a look. Well, look, before I get into the Man United versus Chelsea preview, because I want to keep the suspense going a little bit longer for the team I would pick, I have a feeling that game's going to be a draw, by the way, against Chelsea. I think it's got a draw written all over it, and I'll explain why in a minute. And that's that doesn't help us. That doesn't help Chelsea. I mean, two draws from Brentford and Chelsea away just doesn't help us ahead of the game against Liverpool at the weekend, which is obviously massive. But look, let me talk to you about this breaking news that's come in sort of in the last few hours. Very interesting stuff. Um... Basically, it's saying this, that... Uh, I mean, also, I just want to add this in as well. The players gave their shirts to fans after the Brentford game as a gesture of appreciation for travelling to the 8pm kickoff on Saturday night in West London when there were no trains back to Manchester United. The idea is said to have come from Captain Bruno Fernandes. Now, ultimately, I'm never going to diss a bit of positivity about giving your shirts. The only thing I would say about giving your shirts to travelling fans after the game is... Maybe you should do it every game anyway, considering how much you earn. Also, maybe you should do it before the game kicks off because those fans who put the shirt on are do better than you shithouses did on Saturday night. Harsh, but fair. I'm not over that. I don't think anyone needs to be over that. It was absolutely despicable on Saturday night. And handing a 50 quid shirt, well, a 100 quid shirt out these days, handing a 100 quid shirt, I'll tell you what, I bet it wasn't sweaty. I bet it didn't smell. I bet it, I bet it smelt as fresh as the day it came out of the washing machine because those players didn't bloody run. But no, seriously, I mean, they gave their shirt out after a game. Well done. But what, what are we meant to do with that information? I mean, oh, they gave their shirts out afterwards. I don't care if they took their shirts and threw them in the bin afterwards if you win 3-0 and play well. You know, what are we now? Winners of handing out shirts, FC. You know, we used to be training ground picture, FC. Come on. Let's start winning games of football before we start gloating about handing shirts out. I know I'm being harsh, but to be honest with you, I don't really care. It's what I think. I want Manchester United to play well, and I'm not hip, hip, hip hooraying um, 
in relation to anything else until I see Manchester United start winning games again. That's what it's all about. But the big story is coming in in relation to um, the Telegraph has reported that Manchester United players have held one-on-one -on -one meetings with Sir David Brailsford to find out the Ineos vision to restore the club to its former glory. Uh, Sir, Bra Sir David Brailsford has met most of United's first team squad to present his and Sir Jim Radcliffe's Ineos master plan and take observations and questions from the players. Now, some people are split on this. Um, look, do you think Ineos and Sir Jim Radcliffe and Sir David Brailsford need to be having one-to-one -one meetings with Scott McTominay, Victor Lindelof, Aaron Wambasaka, Harry Maguire, Marcus Rashford, Bruno Fernandes, etc.? I personally don't. We need to get back to discipline. Do you think Man City's owners sit down and speak to Man City's players individually about what's going to happen? Or Liverpool's players? They might. I mean, I don't know is the honest answer, but I don't think we need to do this. These players, some of them are part of our future. Some of them clearly aren't. Why are we sitting down with them and saying this is the plan for the future? I mean, I don't want some of these players to be part of our future. Why are we sitting down with them and taking their thoughts on it? For God's sake, you've literally just seen what they did against Brentford. Why would you listen to anything they've got to say? They are paid employees. They should be impressing you. You don't need to impress them. Why do you need to sit them down and tell them what your plans are? My plans are this. Either get on board or get out. You know, I don't know why we moddy coddle and, you know, protect these players and we have to talk to them about this. It's good to talk. They have got the worst mentality we've had in a Man United squad in years. They don't need to be sat down and told about what the vision is because some of them shouldn't be part of the vision. And those that are going to be part of the vision will be motivated individuals for the right reasons already. I don't really understand it, if I'm being completely honest with you. Maybe someone can tell me why it makes any difference. However, one positive is uh, the one-on-one -on -one talks which have taken place with staff members are not linked to the future of manager Eric Ten Hag and are said to have impressed players and left them feeling optimistic over the future with Ineos now in charge of football reparations. I mean, I, I, again, I just don't care. I've got no interest on any player, whether it's Rasmus, Ganacho, Mainu, players who are part of our future or the players I mentioned before who I don't think should be some of them. I don't care whether they're impressed by Ineos or not. You are paid professionals. You are paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. Do not tell me your bad form has been because of the disruption going on behind the scenes. You go on a pitch, you play football. You can't be on the pitch going, oh, I don't know when we're going to get sold. Oh, is it going to be Ineos or Guitar or will it be a partial ownership? I just don't know. I can't play this five-yard pass. I can't play this five-yard pass and track my runner unless I know the future's bright with Ineos. I can't do it. I know I'm on hundreds of thousands of pounds a week, but I can't make a five-yard pass if I don't know what the future is. Get out. They're paid professionals. Most footballers are bloody mercenaries. They don't need to be pat, pat, there, there. We're going to go and be... Our plan is to be really good in the future and we want you. I mean, what's it all about? What's it all about? What's the big idea? Although I am encouraged to hear that they're not talking to them about the manager. That's a step in the right direction. If it's happening, we do not need to be asking these players about the coaching. I mean, that is like asking a turkey to vote on whether Christmas should go ahead. It shouldn't happen. Um... It also says that Brailsford has moved quickly and decisively since Radcliffe's Ineos investment into Man United, making approaches for Ashworth, who is in line to join as sporting director, and Wilcox, who has been targeted for a technical director job. Well, swiftly, yes. Efficiently, we're still waiting to see when we're going to get those people. Also, it is understood that the players have not been asked to give an opinion on Ten Hag or his management, with Brailsford seemingly keen not to undermine the Dutchman, with Man United still trying to qualify for the Champions League and with an FA Cup semi-final to look forward to. I mean, that, that takes you into uh, a bit of a vague area, doesn't it? So it's understood that Sir David Brailsford hasn't spoken to the players about Ten Hag and his coaches because Man United could still qualify for the Champions League and the FA Cup. I mean, that sort of leaves it open a little bit, doesn't it? That sort of leaves it open a little bit that they might speak to them when we can't win the FA Cup or we can't get the Champions League. I have never, ever heard of such nonsense in all my life. And we have been doing it. I mean, players could willingly go behind the back of Mourinho and speak to Woodward and get him the sack. Players could go behind the back of Oli and get him the sack. So it wouldn't be unusual for players to go around the back of Ten Hag and try and get him the sack because this has been standard practice for years. But I do not want this to happen anymore. If Ineos are thinking about speaking to the players about the next manager, 
They never, ever, 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 ever should have that conversation, whether we sack Ten Hag or not. Players should not be given power on who the next manager is going to be. Absolutely not. They're bloody football players. Then I don't care whether it's Kylian Mbappe. They're football players. They're not there to be asked about who the next manager should be. They're there to be disciplined, dropped, rewarded, motivated. Don't give them power in the dressing room as to who the manager's going to be because the next manager is on an, a slim wicket straight away. This is the problem that Ranić faced when he came in. He was, he, was, he was disrespected and no one listened to him. This is the problem that Oli had at the end. They downed tools on him. This is the problem that Mourinho had at the end. They downed tools on him. We cannot have a system at this football club if we are going to move forward where we ask players what they think about the coaching or the coach. Because... Let me just give you a glimpse into the world of a footballer. They are very self-centred for very good reasons. They can be sold, they can be dropped, they can be injured, they can be the star. But ultimately, their, their colleagues are in competition with them. There might be another striker you might get on, but deep down you want to start. There might be another player you'd get on, but deep down he's earning more than you. So we do not need to speak to players who inherently are ridiculously self-centred. So if you go and speak to a player that's getting game time under Ten Hag and developed under Ten Hag, they're going to say, you know what, I think he's doing really well. The problems really are we're, not, we're, not, we're just not gelling as a team. You go and speak to somebody who's a bit dishevelled or a bit unhappy about something or not getting minutes. Yeah, the coaching's crap. That's why I'm not in the team. There's absolutely no reason at all to go speaking to players about anything to do with the coaching. We need to instill a discipline, a hierarchy. And if we're going to do that, the players are paid footballers. Your job is to play football. If you don't do it, you get out. I don't care why you go. The manager's in charge and in charge of the manager is the board, a director of football, a CEO, and that's how the system's going to work. And I do not want to know what a manager does. And I'll tell you for free, it may have been a long time ago, but it still exists at Liverpool and it still exists at Manchester City. You telling me Jack Grealish or Phil Foden or Erling Haaland, if they're in a bad mood, they're going to go past uh, Pep and speak to the CEO and they're going to listen to them? Absolutely not. You tell me Trent Alexander-Arnold and Mo Salah get pissed off with Klopp and they can go behind his back and speak to the CEO? Absolutely not. But this has been going on at United for years. It has to stop. They can't be speaking to them. And look, I, there's players I really like at that football club. You know, let's take, for example, somebody like Ganacho. I wouldn't want Ganacho being spoken to by Sir David Brailsford and being asked what he thinks about the coaching. I don't care. I don't care what Ganacho thinks. If he doesn't like it, he can put a transfer request in. But what we need is players that are behind the manager, behind the hierarchy, and willing to give absolutely everything. Um, anyway, let's talk about the Chelsea game because that is obviously coming up thick and fast. Um, I don't feel actually like I'm over the Brentford game. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't. Th this one hasn't hit me as hard, but it is similar to the, to the Fulham game where we had this opportunity in front of us to, you know, I, I, think, I think top four, top five went with the Fulham loss. Um, I think that... Even if we'd beaten Brentford and beat Chelsea and got a result against Liverpool, you're still hoping for a Villa and Spurs collapse, which I just don't think is going to happen when they're going head to head with each other. So I think it stopped with Fulham, if I'm being completely honest. But um, the Brentford loss, of the, the Bre well, it felt like a loss. The Brentford draw did us in. I suppose the big question is with Chelsea, how do you approach this game? And 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 the one name that really stands out, and Fash has said it straight away, is what do you do with Mason Mount? Does he come straight into this team? It's against his former club. I personally think there's absolutely no chance that Mason Mount will start this football game because I can't see where he would start him. You cannot start Scott... I mean, if look, I don't like saying stuff like this because there's always context. I don't know the fitness level of Casemiro, but he came on in the second half against Brentford, which was Saturday night. This game is Thursday night. He is fit enough to start. It's the same with Martinez. They both have to start. You have to start Kobe Mainu. You know he's going to start Bruno. So if Scott McTominay starts this game, I'm sorry, Eric, you've lost a bit of support from me again because I can't. I can't back somebody that's that's starting someone like Scott McTominay. You're down to 10 men straight away. We don't need a passenger. So, um, yeah, if I wanted a passenger, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd go driving down. Well, I don't know where I'd go and get a passenger, actually. I'm not I'm not, I'm not, not going to pick up a hitchhiker. I've, I've seen movies where that goes really, really wrong. But, look, you've got to go with the midfield three of Casemiro, Manu and Bruno because that's what he's going to do. Um, that means that Mount's either got to start on the wing. Well, he's not really a winger. People say start Mount instead of Rashford. I can see I can see a value in that. Never going to happen. 
Start him instead of Ganacho. I can see why he might do that. Never going to happen. So I think the front three picks itself. You've, Hoyland's the only striker we've got. Rashford, Ganacho. What I would say is he might, he might drop Ganacho because actually, and I think it would be a bit weak to do it. But the one player that you can probably get away with dropping and no one's going to be outraged by it is the 19-year-old winger. He might regress and go, you know what, I want to force Mount into the team. I can't drop Bruno. I can't drop Rashford, so I'll drop Ganacho. And I'd be pissed off if he did that. There is no way that Ganacho deserves to get dropped ahead of Rashford because if you want to put Mount on the right wing, put Ganacho on the left wing. So I will sit here and say right here, right now, if he drops Ganacho for Mount, it's bang out of order. Does Mount deserve to start, says Walshie? Um, I think he probably does. I certainly think he's banging on the door. I think Ahmad's banging on the door. I mean, he couldn't play against Brentford because he was suspended, but he scored a big goal, a very, very big goal against Liverpool. And I always feared that that Brentford suspension, that stupid referee who sent him off, was going to hurt the momentum of Ahmad because I think it's easy to leave Ahmad out of the Chelsea game now, even though if he did not been suspended for the Brentford game, I think he might have started. So Ahmad probably deserves a start. I think also... Mount deserves a start, but where are you going to fit him into the team is very, very interesting. Um, he, he won't change that midfield. Now, look, if you wanted to be really, really, really clever and really out of the box, what I would probably do is start Ganacho on the left, Ahmad on the right, Mount at 10 and drop Bruno and Rashford. Never, ever going to happen. Never, ever going to happen. On pure footballing ability and form, it should happen. But you're not just dropping two players who are out of form. You're dropping two massive leaders in the dressing room who have influence over a lot of people in that team. So you drop Rashford and Bruno, I think you might be you know, signing your own death warrant as a manager for Manchester United. And I, I just don't think Ten Hag dare do that. Um, would I do it? Well, of course I would. I'm sat from the comfort of this chair saying, yeah, of course I would. But I'm not living the reality of doing that. Um, and that's why I mention it. You know, it's very easy for you to sit there, you know, from the safety of a live chat and say he's got to drop Rashford and Bruno on form. He probably should do. But it's bigger than that. If you go back 20 years ago, it would be like saying dropping, you know, David Beckham. No, David Beckham wasn't here. It'd be like dropping Roy Keane and Gary Neville, like two massive influences in the dressing room. And now you think about that or Ryan Giggs, or Paul Scholes. It's massive. They're mass And of course, Keane, Giggs, Scholes, and, and, and um, Neville should never be compared to Bruno and, and Rashford, but it's the same influence on a dressing room, and that's why I don't believe he will do it. So where you shoehorn Mount into that team is very, very difficult. I, I suspect if he was to do it, he'd drop Ganacho, and that would be disgusting. That would be absolutely disgusting. Look, Ganacho didn't play well against Brentford, but across the last 10 games, he's been way better than Rashford. So what are we doing? We're dropping the kid to, you know, look after the senior players who aren't performing again. That would be the wrong thing to do. So um, I, I think that if he wants to play Mount on the wing, you've got to move Ganacho to the left and drop Rashford. But I think this is the team he'll go with because actually it's easier to drop... Um, it's easier to drop... Uh, it's easier not to pick Mount, isn't it? The back four, I mean, look, there are there is a little bit of shakiness here. Um, I don't know how fit Varane is. He may not be fit, in which case plan A goes out the window again because at least if Varane plays, you can play a high line, Varane and Martinez. I mean, how many games have Varane and Martinez started with each together this season? I don't think you can fill a hand with it. I don't think it's happened five times. So, you know, we've played well over 40 games this season. We've not started Varane and Martinez five times. What do we know when you don't start Varane and Martinez? You can't play a high line. So basically, for most of the season, we can't play the way we want to play. If Varane and Martinez plays, it will make a big difference on the way that we play. If they don't play and it's Martinez and Maguire or Martinez and Lindelof or Evans, we're going to have to drop the line again because they've got pace probably with Jackson up front and we can't, we can't play deep. So... Martinez comes back, Varane gets injured. Varane comes back, Martinez is injured. It, it just it doesn't work for us this year, does it? Um, you've got to play wan at left back, even though he was atrocious against Brentford. He is a fullback, and obviously delo has got to play at right back, and Anana's got to play in goal. Um, so I think that will be the team, um, absolutely. Um, Mark, do you think Fergie would have survived this social media branding era? Yeah, I do, Parker, because I think Sir Alex Ferguson knew was a great, great manager. Uh, Mario Franco says, why Ineos don't speak to fans first? They're losing us, is there, Mario? Uh, Lee Woolsey says, is there a chance that Ineos are leaking about new staff the same way the Glazers would leak about being in for a player after loss to pick placators? 
Um, yo, Mark, keep up the great work, says Jide. And M. Linnell, thank you very much for your super chat. And uh, Samir says, I agree about Ganacho, but I do think he's fatigued. Mount for McTominay, though, is a must. Don't care what formation make it work. Well, the thing about that, Samir, is if you bring Mount in for McTominay, you're playing uh, Mainu, Mount, and Bruno as a midfield three. Now, look, let's talk about Chelsea for a moment. Chelsea midfield is Casido, Enzo, and Gallagher. Now, all three of those players, whatever you think about them, and they've not had great seasons collectively, but individually, they're good players. They're tenacious players. If you put Bruno Mount and Mainu against Gallagher, Enzo and Casido, you're screwed. Absolutely screwed. Roman says, no watch-alongs today. Yep, straight after this, quarter past eight, West Ham against Spurs. Um, so yeah, look, let's have a look at this game, Chelsea. Chelsea's home form this season has them mid-table, which is where they are. Well, not even mid-table. They're in the bottom half of the table, which is exactly where they are in real life. They've played six, uh, they've played, uh, they, they've played 14 games at home. They've won six, they've drawn four, and they've lost four. They've scored 25 goals, they've conceded 22 goals. Uh, the chance of a clean sheet is 21%. The chance of both teams scoring is 57%. Uh, their average points at home this season are 1.5. So they're bordering around drawing a lot, really. Um, and there's a 79% chance that there'll be more than one and a half goals, which means both teams to score is probably a good bet. I'm going for a draw on this one, people. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this has got a draw written all over it. Um, I think 1-1. One, one would be my score prediction. Uh, Chelsea don't score many goals. We don't score many goals. Um, and therefore, I think a 1-1 draw is absolutely the most obvious scoreline to go for. And it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us at all. If we were to draw, then potentially what we're doing is, is opening up the door for those behind us to start closing in on us. Uh, if you look at the league table and how it stands at the moment, um, we are currently in sixth place with 48 points. Newcastle are right behind us. West Ham are playing tonight, of course. Uh, Brighton are a few points off us. But yeah, if we were to draw this game, we're inviting those behind us and that gap gets bigger up at the top, doesn't it? So uh, a draw doesn't help us, especially with Liverpool. In fact, if we draw against Chelsea, we drew against Brentford and we lose against Liverpool. Two points from nine. I wouldn't be surprised if we're not sixth on Sunday. So the Chelsea game really, I mean, God. God forbid. I think. I think. I think. I think this game actually. Um, what I was thinking about is that I think this game could be a nail in the coffin of uh, the manager actually, because this is the sort of game where if you were to lose three or four nil to Chelsea, no one's going to give any leeway on that. They're not. They're going to go. Chelsea are crap. They're winning one nil against Burnley, who are down to ten men, and they draw two two. And then the next game, you get beat three or four nil by them. If Chelsea run riot over us, I think it's I think it's over. I do. I think it's over. And um, you know, it should be over for certain players, but that's not how Man United run. So I think this game could be quite symbolic on Thursday night. And and actually, I'll go with a draw because that's the most logical result. But honestly, I haven't got a bloody clue how this will, will pan out. I've got no idea at all. And if you have fair play, I don't know. I, you don't know what you're going to get with United. We could go there, play really well and nick a win. We could go there, play absolutely shit and get stuffed. I, I just don't know with this team anymore. And that's about the players. You know, you can talk about the manager. The manager sends the players out with the same instructions every game. Some games it works, some games it doesn't. So... What does that tell you? It's all about whether the players want to switch on or not and where they are mentally. And as we know with these players mentally, when they're not on it, they're a bloody liability. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, these two games are horrific, really. Thursday night against Chelsea and then Sunday afternoon against Liverpool. Um, really hard, really hard to predict which way it's going to go. Uh, Connor Head's been a member for 49 months. Thank you very much. Scott Hoggreaves has been a Scott Hoggreaves has been a member for 42 months. Legend. Uh, Jason's been a member for three months. He says Mount on the right, Ganacho on the left. Well, I think a lot. I think a lot of people might agree with that. I don't. I don't think it'll happen. Uh, I don't think it'll happen. If I'm being honest. Um, David says Rashford's a disgrace. Um, Tudor says crap instructions, mate. I'm not going to get into this petty little thing. I don't know whether you're. Uh, I don't know whether you're a wind-up or an idiot, but um, I'm tired of having conversations about tactics because uh, if you don't watch football, then that's your problem, but most of us do. And tactics mean absolutely nothing when you're watching a team that can't run back, that can't put a foot in for a tackle, that can't be asked to go for a second ball and can't play a five-yard pass. You learn those things at six years of age. You don't learn that from Pep Guardiola. You know, they are the basics of the game. And on Saturday night, I watched numerous players 
multiple multiple times not implement the basics of the game and then you've got people talking about tactics and style of play yeah you don't you learn from your school PE teacher when you're six years of age to pass the ball against the wall and control it, a five-yard pass. You learn when you're seven years of age to track back and keep running. You know, these are basic things that the players aren't doing. And look, there are tactical deficiencies. There are selections and substitutions that make no sense. But I don't care whether you're bloody Jamie Carragher or Jamie in the chat. The reality is, um, or Jenny from the block, it doesn't matter to me. And I'm not impressed by the block rocks that you got. What I'm trying to tell you is that what I saw on Saturday night and what I've seen a few times, Liverpool away, is not tactical. It's just players can't be asked. I can't be asked to concentrate on a five-yard pass. I can't be asked to track back. I can't be asked to go and try and win the second ball. That's not tactics. You do not train that on a training ground. You'd be, you know, Pep Guardiola said to his players tomorrow, right, we've got Villa tonight. We're going to practice trying to win the second ball. We're going to practice tra tracking back. Right, I'm throwing the ball into the opposition half. Chase it as fast as you can, Rodri. Chase it as fast as you can, De Bruyne. Right, we're going back and trying that again. You don't, you don't train those things. They are, they are not even spoken about because they are expected. It is expected that you can pass the ball five yards. It is expected that you will track back. It is expected that you will go and try and win the second ball. And when the players aren't doing that, and you think that's on the manager, you've never played a game of football in your life because... That is not tactical. That is pure basics. And I watched the game on Saturday. You watched the game on Saturday. And we failed on basics. Doesn't matter whether you manage a Southgate or not. You, that would be a failure on basics. Uh, Mark, when do you when you do these predicted lineups, do you already have an idea if you will start? Yeah, yeah. Kevin, uh, Eric normally sends me a WhatsApp and says that's roughly going to... I've got no idea. I've got no idea. I don't know the team. Uh, I don't think anybody would know the team yet. It's 48 hours before, not even the players themselves. Tony says it's down to the players and they've proven they know how to switch it on and off. Eric Ten Hag in. He needs time and players willing to give it their all. Well, Tony, I'm going to be balanced here. I mean, you've got somebody talking about, you know, the way we played on Saturday's tactical, which obviously it's not. And then you're saying Eric Ten Hag in. I'm, going to, I'm not playing that game. It's not about Ten Hag for me. Ultimately, there are games that are going to sack him or keep him in a job. As I said, you know, if he picks McTominay on Thursday night, I'm going to find it very, very difficult to stick with him. I will. Because I, there's, there's, unless everybody's injured again, that, that's just bloody stupid. We've got to stop doing that. And if he thinks that's the thing to do, he probably needs to be sacked because I don't want a manager that keeps picking Scott McTominay when Casemiro and Maynu and Mount and Bruno are available. So... You know, I'm not going to sit here and start saying Ten Hag in. He's got to start behaving like a Manchester United manager or he's going to he's going to get sacked and he's going to have major regrets. And that's basically what happened to Jose, Oli, Ranić, Van Hal. I don't want another manager sacked with regrets. They've got to start doing what they need to do. Uh, Danger man, Cole Palmer. Um, I think he's, you know, when I look at Man United, do you think we've had a player? I mean, Chelsea have been shit this year. But when you look at Man United, do you see a player that's our player of the year, that's been anywhere near as good as Cole Palmer. He's the danger man. Like, he's had an amazing season for for Chelsea after signing from Manchester City. Um, he's their danger man. He's had an amazing season. I wish we'd had a player that had been that good. And I know delo has been good, and Maynard's been good, and Rasmus has been good at parts, and ganacho has been good. But nobody's been as consistently good as Cole Palmer in a shit team. So he's the danger man tomorrow. We've got to be very, very careful about him. Uh, thank you very much to Kevin Landigas. Uh, thank you very much for joining the members club. Uh, appreciate that. Um, United BT says dominated overall by Brentford for 90 minutes. Ain't tactics. No, it's not, mate. I, I can't. You know what? I, I refuse to keep explaining this. I was on the podcast today. You can check the new podcast out. Actually, it's just uh, it's just come out today. And uh, I was saying a few weeks ago, I said that there's no way in a million years that Erling Haaland starts for Liverpool because he doesn't suit the way that they play. He doesn't work hard from the front. He doesn't link up. He doesn't create. He wouldn't start in a Klopp system. And you get these real footballing idiots who go, of course he would. He'd start for every, anyone. And you think you don't really watch football, do you? You watch it on a very basic level. You just basically say, he's world class. He'd start for anyone. You don't look at systems. You don't look at what's actually going on the pitch. And you're the same. You watch a game, we draw with Brentford and you put it all on the manager. And yet you're not actually realising that when people can't pass the ball five yards, that's not tactics. When people don't track back, that's not tactics. And when people can't be asked to go for a 50-50, that's not tactics. And if you can't pass the ball five yards and you're unwilling to track back and you won't go in for 50-50s, you'll get dominated. Whatever the tactics are, 
you will get dominated. Because if I'm a manager and I'm saying, when you get the ball, move it around quickly. Well, they can't move it around quickly if they can't do a simple pass. So yeah, there were some weird substitutions. I'll, I'll agree with that. And yeah, the press doesn't work. I'll agree with that. But come on, if you watch that game, we didn't get dominated because of the tactics. We could have played park the bus football. We could have played high line football. We'd have still been hammered because it doesn't matter what the tactics are when the players don't implement the basics. So yeah, admittedly, I wasn't happy with a lot of the stuff Ten Hag did on Saturday. But to exclusively blame it on him, so it's his fault Scott McTominay doesn't track back well. It's his fault that Bruno can't pass the ball five yards. It's his fault that people aren't going in for 50-50s. Come on. They're basics. And if you don't understand that, I don't think you watch football, really. I don't think you played it either. If we play like we did against Liverpool, do you think we're going to win? Uh, Stian, the trouble with the Liverpool game is it was chaos. It was chaos football. Liverpool, we had Bruno Fernandes at centre-back. You can't learn anything from Liverpool other than against Liverpool, we did put the effort in. We did go for the second balls. We did win the 50-50s. We did play the five-yard passes. So the difference between Liverpool and Brentford was there's no tactics, there's no structure in the Liverpool game, but there's effort, concentration and desire and passion and, you know, tenacity. Against Brentford, none of those things are there. So if we can play against Chelsea with the focus that we did against Liverpool in that extra time in the last 10 minutes, then, you know, maybe we'll win the game. If we play the game against Chelsea and people aren't making five-yard passes again and they're not tracking back and they're not going for 50-50s, we will lose. Is that downing tools? Well, if it isn't, I don't know what it is. Uh, Sub, thank you very much for joining the Members Club. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, really good. What was this one here? I can't read it. Oh, help. Come on. Let's be having you. Why is this not working? Okay. Uh, Mark, I've done that one. Sensei says, the ability of these players to switch off, lose focus and composure baffles me. The mentality of these players needs to be highlighted. Well, that's what, that's what we try to do. That's what we try to do. But sometimes people still want to find a way not to blame them when they don't turn up. They didn't turn up against Brentford. That's the worst performance of the season for me. Right, I've got to go because I've got to go and watch Spurs against West Ham. It's starting in like 10 minutes. So um, I will see you over there in 10. Don't forget to check out the podcast, Goldbridge Saves Football. There's a good section about United in there today as well. Support the podcast, Ultras. It's your podcast, of course. And I will see you over on That's Football in a few minutes. And obviously, I'm back on the 10 o'clock show tomorrow. Got Ten Hogs press conference tomorrow. It's, everything's coming in thick and fast, isn't it? Get your comments in below about everything that we've spoken about. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see what there is to say. Take care. Thanks for watching.